places. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Monday of the month, so it's time to introduce a brand new show, Goodbye Lupus with Dr. Brooke Goldner. She's here today to talk about the five hardest things about going plant-based. Please welcome her to the show. I'm so glad you took a regular spot because you just you're just so vivacious and fun. And I just love your content. So thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. I love it. I always get, and when Pete, you have great fans, whenever I'm on your show, people write to me just to tell me how glad they were that I was there. So you have really hardcore yeah. fans uh, and well-deserved. Thank you. And they they were so excited that you had a regular slot. And we have such wonderful medical doctors that are coming on the show. And the work you do with people with um, lupus and I guess all autoimmune diseases really has just been so great. And did I hear from, and I can't remember who, that you're actually publishing research about it? Well, yeah, I have, I have published uh, case studies. Um, it's very hard to do, though. Uh, most of the mainstream, um, I really want to get into the mainstream, like rheumatology, you know, journals, and they are not interested in nutrition. They're not interested in case studies. So it's actually really hard, but I have someone who's pushing for me trying to get that in there because it's a lot easier to get it into like nutrition journals or like, you know, plant-based kind of stuff, but it is hard. It is definitely a hard thing. It's one of the reasons why I come straight to the public, because if you wanted to wait for it to come through, you know, those resources, it's going to be a long time in coming. Yeah. Well, you know what, even without that, if it's validation, if you think it is, you're helping so many people. So that really is what matters. Yep, thank you. Well, the truth always comes out. You can't suppress it forever. It's just so, it's just crazy that, that I, you would think that every doctor, when they heard this, even if it was only one person would at least want to try it, but nope. Pills oh, you don't know. So many of the people I work with, they, their doctors will say diet has nothing to do with it. You are going to have lupus forever. You're going to have kidney failure forever. There's nothing that happened. They work with me. Everything gets better. They heal. They come off their meds and they'll go, I don't know what happened, but it's definitely not the diet. Like, it's just like, a, you know, that's why I posted recently that some people will believe what they see and others will only see what they believe. And, uh, you know, so it goes both ways. There are definitely doctors who get excited, who refer to me, who come to me themselves. And then there's others who, no matter what evidence they face, just refuse to see it because they just, you know, have their previous programming in place and just won't release it. I mean, there's no harm in trying it. It's low cost. There's really no side effects. So I just don't understand why everybody doesn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you too, huh? You don't, yeah, you're, you're, I mean, that's the thing, but again, the truth comes out because I mean, you and I have been around a long time and, uh, and if it wasn't the case, there would be so much pushback and it's just not the pushback is always what people assume, but the people who actually do it have results, you know? And so even when somebody says something negative, uh, you know, online or as a comment to me, there's always a whole bunch of people who reply after no, her program helped me get rid of lupus. Her program got rid of my high cholesterol, you know? And so there's just the pushback is never from results. It's always from theories or fears or, you know, assumptions and things like that. So, you know, it's making a difference. Do you work mostly with people with lupus or can they have any autoimmune disease? Really any, any illness at all. So I became most well known for lupus because of my own story that, you know, I had lupus for 12 years of my life and kidney failure and mini strokes and, and medicines kept me alive, but diet healed me. And this year is 17 years, actually 2023 will be 18 years once we hit April. Um, that, so it'll be, you know, it's over 17 years that I've been lupus free with normal kidneys, no blood clots, had kids and all because I changed my diet. Right. So, so goodbye lupus was my story. That's why my first book's called goodbye lupus. It's what happened to me and what I did to get there. Right. Um, and then, you know, over the years, I've helped people with so many different autoimmune diseases. So I kind of became a beacon of hope for autoimmune disease specifically because of my story and my protocol, which is specific for cellular repair in the immune system. But it turns out you can apply that protocol to your body and it will help you optimize your health in general, right? So diabetes, high cholesterol, heart issues, amyloid. I mean, there's just so many different things people come to me before and their health gets better. I have some cardiologists in New York who say that my pro my protocol works the best for their patients. So it's not just autoimmune, but it's more like if you can help someone with autoimmune disease, then anybody can get better, right? That that's like, those are supposed to be diseases where there's no hope and absolutely they can get healthy. 
Um, I'm actually staring down a birthday, February 11th, I'm going to be 46. Um, so it will be 30 years since I was diagnosed when I turned 46 and 30 years um, after being diagnosed with lupus and stage four kidney failure, I wasn't expected to live the first year and, uh, and I'm still kicking. So that's why I do this. That's why I like to give my time because if I give my time to the public, somebody might see this whose life could be saved forever. So that's why I'm happy to be here with you. Well, that is fantastic. Well, the reason I ask this, whenever we have any medical doctor on, we get so many people emailing questions. And a couple of the questions were actually about an autoimmune disease that for the people that have it, there seems to be no hope. And I'm wondering if you have ever worked with interstitial cystitis patients. Absolutely. I used to have interstitial cystitis. Whoa. Uh, yeah. So it's inflammation of the bladder. Basically, it feels like you have a UTI every day. Torture. Like I felt like that was worth an arthritis because arthritis, I could take some, some pain medicines and it got better, but the cystitis was terrible and that got better with, with changing my diet, you know? So That's yeah, it. sometimes we have to tweak things a bit, depending on how much volume they can handle, but absolutely any itis, itis is Latin for inflammation. Yeah. So any itis you could potentially uh, get rid of with anti-inflammatory nutrition and lifestyle. That's fantastic. So five hardest things I've been vegan for 45 years and I, I can't even remember it being hard because I was, I was so young, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, you know, one of the biggest things that happens whenever anybody brings up the idea of like, okay, you can get better. Great. What do you need to do? A plant-based diet. Oh, and then immediately their brain starts coming up with all the reasons why they can't. Right. And so I thought, you know, we spend a lot of time telling people why they should go plant based. What if we just start out with addressing the five biggest reasons that it might be hard to go plant based so we can talk about that and kind of come up with solutions to help the public. So that's why I thought I'd give you today. Should I should I roll it? Absolutely. Somebody saying vegan or plant based. I mean, I you never how do you never how do you know what word to use? You know, well. Well, there's, there's vegan is a much more loaded word, right? So vegan is, um, is not just about what you eat. It's about how you live. So when you are vegan, then you are living a lifestyle, which is supposed to, um, cause the least amount of harm on anyone or anything. So on the planet, on animals, and of course it, it ends up being for people too, if you eat the right uh, vegan diet, but vegan is more of a lifestyle of no harm. So not eating anything that comes from animals and also not wearing anything that comes from animals, not using products that come from animals or that were tested on animals. So, so veganism is really a, a lifestyle. It's an ethical movement for the animals, for the planet. Uh, plant-based is a way of eating that optimizes human health. So when we say plant-based, we're talking about eating foods that come from plants. Uh, and mostly come from plants. Some people say they're plant-based or mostly plant-based. You can't say you're mostly vegan, right? Because it's an ethical movement. You are, you aren't. <laughs> so vegans get very upset when someone says I'm mostly vegan. They, they yeah, get I'm, really upset. But, I'm, mostly faith, I'm mostly faithful to my wife. Mostly. Right? Yes, exactly. Mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Except when I'm out of time. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's an ethical thing. You are in or you're out, right? But yep. with plant-based, it's really about a way of eating. And, and you know, Colin Campbell came up with the whole like whole food plant-based. This way of eating where you're eating from nature and it's unprocessed and it's, um, you know, and it's the healthiest foods, right? So you are definitely, if you, when you're vegan, you have a choice. You can eat vegan junk food. You can eat healthy food, right? But plant-based is about eating healthy and you can be both. I am both things. I, I identify as vegan and I'm also plant-based. So I live in a way where I don't buy products or wear products that come from animals. And I, you know, only use cruelty-free and all that kind of stuff. And I eat in a way that's optimal for my health. Nice. All of the above. Cause you know what? It turns out you can live a life of no harm or, or minimal harm and be healthy and happy. And I prefer to live that way. Yep. And you you have a whole family that lives that way too. Yeah. Yeah. Like my kids are hardcore vegan, ethical vegans, right? Like Solomon wrote his book about, you know, it wasn't just there. He talks about health in some cases, but really it's about all the reasons. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He's been on the show. He's adorable. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm guessing, well, okay. I'm, I'm, do you want me to guess what one of them is? All right. You want to guess? Okay, sure. Let's well, play. I, I mean, what I hear, you know, it's, it's so expensive. Oh, that wasn't even one on my list. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think that that one is mostly comes from people thinking and not people actually going to the supermarket. You know, uh, <laughs> have you been seeing the posts online from people who are saying, um, uh, marking themselves safe from the high egg prices because they're vegan? 
you know, uh, so egg prices are going up because people are trying to eat less animals, but now they're eating more eggs. And so prices are going up. Um, but in general, produce, um, especially if you're not, I mean, if you're buying organic produce, that can start to get expensive. When I uh, healed from lupus, I couldn't afford organic produce. I was a resident. I was an intern. So um, I ate just regular produce that, that had pesticides and things, and I still got rid of lupus. So the benefits of the produce outweighed whatever, you know, was happening. Now, if you could afford it, great. If you can't still eat your, your veggies, um, but things like meat, dairy products, well, dairy products would cost more if they weren't subsidized. Um, but meat is, is expensive. Um, things that you get like quinoa and beans and things, those are pretty cheap and you can buy them in bulk. Flax and chia seeds are dollar twenty a pound or so. So, you know, it really depends on what you're buying, but I don't find it to be expensive. Here, I'll run you through. So here's my top five that I came up with today. All right. Number five was, um, what about if I travel? Right. So a lot of times when I start talking to people about, here's what you need to do right now to get healthy. This is going to get your health back. Do it this. Well, I have a trip coming up in this about a time. How am I supposed to be vegan plant-based, you know, and be able to do those things? Um, I have traveled a lot uh, since I've been eating this way. And I'm sure you have as well. And, uh, and I find that, you know, every place I've ever been to has choices, especially if you're vegan. If you're just doing like vegan plant-based eating, there's always some kind of grain, there's some kind of beans or lentils, there's fresh fruits and vegetables. I mean, everywhere you can go. Now, there are exceptions in places where, um, you know, especially in areas of the world where they don't have good, clean uh, water, where there can be contamination and, um, you know, some, some bad infections and things you could get from fresh raw produce. But most places that people go, uh, that's not a problem at all. And so what I usually tell people is, okay, if you're going to travel, first of all, um, where, where I've traveled, especially in the U.S., everywhere I've ever been or stayed has been near either a Walmart or a supermarket. So what I do is I check in and then I go to the local Walmart or supermarket, whatever's closer. And I just go right to the produce aisle because I'm teaching people how to eat super healthy, high amounts of produce. You just go in there. They have containers of guacamole set to go. They've got fresh raw foods. A lot of them's already chopped. And so you can go and get food and bring it right to your room. Um, I have found a trick that most hotels, if you tell them that you need a, a refrigerator for medical reasons, they will provide you one without charging you. So um, people who are working with me, it is a medical reason, right? You, you medically need to have different food. And so a lot of times it'll do that. Also, fresh fruits and vegetables don't need to be refrigerated. So you can have a whole table or a counter full of all that produce and it's going to be not fine for the next few days. Um, people ask me a lot about, you know, with green smoothies, how, what do I do? You can bring a travel blender. Um, you can also, what I found is that I brought stuff down to the bartender before because the bartender is a blender. Hey, will you blend me this? And they'll do it. No problem. Give them a tip. They'll blend for you. Um, it's also easier to eat the foods when you're traveling. So also wherever you're staying, call ahead, talk to the chef at the restaurant and tell them what your diet is. And if you give them notice, they're always happy to take care of you. I've stayed at so many different hotels. They're there to please you. So you tell them, listen, I need to have a salad that has about this much of this, this much of that, or whatever. And you talk to them, they'll be ready for you. I've stayed at hotels where I tell them I show up and I'm like, oh, and they go, oh, that's her. Okay. And then they bring me out my dish. And then usually I have to tell them to make it four times larger um, <laughs> because I need to eat a really big salad. I'll never find any big one, but you need to talk to them, plan in advance, and most places will take care of you. Uh, Ellen Daffy Jones, when she did my program to reverse her psoriasis, she actually went on a cruise while on my plan eating only raw foods, and she got the maitre d' at the restaurant to blend green smoothies for her. So every morning she'd check in and they'd go downstairs and bring her her smoothie. So, you know, whether you're on a cruise or a hotel or wherever you're traveling, Airbnb it, there's usually a way for you to easily do it. You just have to plan. If you plan, it tends to be pretty darn easy. Yeah. You want to hear something funny, Dr. Goldner? So sure. I agree with you about the refrigerator and it has worked for me most of my life. However, some hotels must be getting smart to this. And I, I was at this thing in Vegas and my, my friends had gotten there first. They got the, a couple of refrigerators. And when I came, they said, we're out of refrigerators. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I have to store my medication. There's this thing called a medication refrigerator. That's like really, really tiny. Like, oh. I guess you could put insulin or something in it, but you sure can't put food in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You want a real refrigerator. I mean, they usually have 
some option. But lately, the hotels use the refrigerator to store all the alcohol in it. And if you move a bottle out of the way, it charges you automatically. So now we have to ask specifically, I need a fridge. Um, and I mean, they, uh, they will often have one, even if you ask for it, where they might charge you for it, but at least try to see if you can get one for health reasons. And again, produce typically doesn't really need to be refrigerated if you're going to eat it within the next few days. So you can got to get away with it. But that's funny. If you're traveling with a whole lot of plant eaters, you might get stuck. The other thing is to stay in one of those little suites. You know, they tend to have those little rooms that have like a kitchenette that solves it. But I find communicating is, is really nice. There's actually a restaurant uh, in Houston. Well, there's a hotel in Houston. There's a really beautiful hotel that we just like to go to because it's just gorgeous and they have all this art and everything. No vegan food in the menu. And so my husband and I talked to them and we wanted to stay there for a little staycation, you know, grandma with the kids, us stay there. And we asked if they'd be willing to make us food. And they sent it out to their chefs. One chef volunteered and he made five course menus. I mean, they were amazing menus, tofu scramble, and he made eggplant bacon and all this stuff. And it was so delicious, so wonderful. They permanently made a vegan menu to have their full time. So because we asked and we stayed there, they now have a, a full vegan menu, breakfast, lunch, dinner available for people who want to come in and ask about it. So, you know, it's it, they're usually willing and even interested and excited to make things for you if you just ask. Absolutely. And about that thing about where you're automatically charged for moving, I know what you're talking about. And what I told them, I said, look, I'm an alcoholic, so you have to take this all out. And then I got a refrigerator. Oh, that. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I said, you have to get this out of here. And they did. Uh, give me a regular fridge. That's right. Oh, that works. That works. Hey. Yeah. Um, one way or another, right? But again, you have to be more committed than your obstacles. And that's really what this is about. The, the next most common one that I hear about is restaurants. And it's kind of along the same lines. I mean, when it comes to restaurants, I mean, number one, um, when people are changing their diet, especially for health reasons, sometimes restaurants can be triggering, just like an alcoholic shouldn't go to a bar uh, or, you know, or a nightclub when they're first trying to get clean, right? That going to restaurants can be triggering. They're going to put the chips and the bread in the middle of the table and, and all this stuff. And um, and so you have to also be aware of where, why are you going? Like if you're going on a date night, I always recommend redesign date nights, right? Where they're not just about sitting at a table with a bread basket between you, but maybe going to a museum or a show or, or somewhere, you know, that, where you can get an emotional, beautiful experience together. That's not about sitting and eating. So a lot of us, a lot of people, well, really all over the world, all of our social stuff really revolves around food and getting high together on junk, right? So uh, really separating that out is so important. And so that's the first thing is why are you going to the restaurant? If it's for your quality time with your significant other or your friends, maybe you can organize something else where you all go like to a rock climbing place together or the trampoline place and jump around together, or you go to a museum exhibit together, something else where you can have the experience without having all of that junk in front of you. Uh, if it's if it's an event uh, where where you want to go to a restaurant, then just check ahead, right? So number one, there are places you can go that have amazing, delicious food. I mean, we went to Salada twice this weekend. I posted a little reel from my family. It's our family's favorite place. We are the only ones I think that make them lose money because they have, it's like a gigantic salad bar, but it's not self-serve, you tell them. And uh, we go to the lettuce area and they go, what do you want? Which one do you want? And I say, yes. And they have to give us all of it, spinach, kale, romaine. All right, which vegetables? Yes. All the vegetables, which fruit? Yes. Yeah. So everything except the dairy and eggs area and so, you know, other people's salads are this big. We get these big, giant bowls that we carry out. And my kids love it. We love it. And, you know, it's a fun spot. We get to have family time. We're at a restaurant, but it's healthy food. Um, there are places that are non-vegan that tend to have great food, if you ask them. You know, like uh, even Cheesecake Factory has that, like, vegan Cobb salad, power salad, where you could change out maybe the dressing or some things that have oil and turn it into something healthy. So, so if you can be in charge of choosing, choose a place that you already know has food that you can easily eat and be satisfied by. Now, if it's somebody else choosing, um, then one, you know, if it's someone you're close to, maybe let them know that that will be a hard place for you to eat and see if, they'd be open to trying something new. But if it's something already set, then again, just like traveling, look ahead, right? So what is on the menu that you might be able to eat if they change it around and then call and talk to the chef? It's harder on the restaurant, the staff, 
when you show up and start redesigning the menu. That's always hard, especially if it's busy. But if you call ahead, they usually have no problem with it at all. I mean, they'll usually do stuff in the moment for you too. It just can be more stressful. So again, anytime you know you're going somewhere, do that. I have people who are doing rapid recovery with me where they work with me every day. And I'll just tell them, send me the menu. And I'll look at the menu and circle what I want them to eat and what not to eat. And just here you go, right? So you're just looking for like, if you're going to eat salad and they have five salad options. You then pick out all the ingredients they have that you know are on, on your plan and ask for them all in one bowl and then take out all of the cheese and, you know, uh, off plan dressings and things like that. So if they have it on the menu, you can eat it. I mean, I remember one time going to a hotel and it was late night and there was just like, I just want to eat something and go to bed. And I open up the menu and they didn't even have the only salad on the menu was iceberg lettuce with blue cheese on top. You know, there was just really, and I didn't want to eat iceberg lettuce for dinner. And then I saw they had Brussels sprouts with, with bacon. And I said, you have Brussels sprouts. Can you just steam me like a pound of Brussels sprouts? Like just, you know, and my husband was like, oh, me too. And we got a tower of Brussels sprouts and we just put salt and pepper and ate it. And, you know, it was delicious. I love Brussels sprouts, but it was just one of those things that if it's on the menu, even if it's coated in meat, if there's a way, if it's on the menu, they have it and you might be able to work something out for yourself. Um, if you're on a very strict plan, you have to plan more. Again, if you're on like a raw plan, having stuff with you or calling ahead is always the best thing to do. But I find restaurants are really friendly if you just give them a chance. And a lot of times the non-vegan restaurants are easier to get good food than the vegan restaurants because some of the vegan restaurants don't even have salad, right? They're all about impossible burgers and, and junk. And sometimes you can't even get something healthy. Um, but, you know, just a little bit of planning. And if worst case scenario, there's absolutely nothing and you know you want to go there for social reasons, eat first and show up there and order some tea. And then when they say, why are you eating? Go, I ate before I got here, but I'm just here for the company and just enjoy the company. You know, the last thing you want to do is show up hungry and like suffer, you know, so all of it really involves planning. Once you get the hang of it, it's really not difficult. Uh, just like anybody else with a dietary restriction has to learn how to navigate it, whether it's diabetes or whatever else that they're dealing with, you can learn it and it becomes so second nature. It's really not a struggle at all. And uh, I find that I have a great time going out with people to restaurants and I don't really have a problem with that. So that's, those are the two that I hear a lot that I think are very easy to bypass with a little bit of planning. Then the other three really involve more like emotional kind of reasons. Um, the third one I have is really like, how can I be social? And um, I, I'm dealing with this right now because we have a, a rapid recovery group right now. So they're in their, they just finished their first week. So everybody's emotional. They're all in withdrawal. They're all like, you know, they're going through, you know, feeling tired and detoxing all this stuff and trying to to get over their food addictions. And so everyone's a mess. And so they're finding excuses to be off plan that seem to make sense. And one of the biggest excuses I'm seeing is, well, I'm being social with my friends. Um, and so I just want to blend in and I'm just trying to, to hang out and it's all here. And it's really important again, to see that you can get that social happiness and not have it be connected to food. And one of the biggest ways you do that is just by telling people, <laughs> I don't know why people don't want to tell people. Just tell people, hey, I'm doing this new thing. I'm eating plant-based or vegan, whatever it is. Um, so don't worry about me. Don't even offer me foods. I'm going to navigate my own way. I'm just here to hang out with you guys. And I've got this, right? So just kind of letting people know, because I find a lot of folks, they don't want to let people know. And then they get all this peer pressure, right? Like if you stop drinking and you don't tell anyone I'm clean and sober from drinking now, they might still try to get you to drink a shot with them or have some champagne to celebrate. And you've got to say, no, no, no. I don't drink anymore, right? So it's really important to tell people, hey, I'm doing this thing. And you don't have to tell them your personal health stuff. You don't have to give them all of your sensitive information. You can say whatever you want. You're doing a cleanse. You're doing a, a January boost, whatever you want to do. But just let them know, hey, um, I'm not going to be eating the stuff that you're eating because I'm doing this new way of eating, this diet, this cleanse, whatever you want to call it. Um, so don't offer me anything. All right. Uh, I'm just here to enjoy the company and I'll take care of it myself. And so I feel like if people would just let others know, they'd have so much more support and comfort in social situations. I mean, I'm sure with you, I know for me, if anyone invites me somewhere who happens not to be vegan or plant-based, they always ask me, hey, what can I have for you? What can I make for you? And, and that's an act of love, right? Making food is a, is a way that people show love. And so you just tell them like, oh, I would love it if you, you know, had a salad um, and don't worry about the dressing, I'll bring one. Or if you're going to just have some vinegars out there for me or something, you know, that if you just let people know, 
Uh, they'll get to take care of you and show you that love and support. And if it's not a situation like that, like someone in my group right now is at a, uh, a bachelorette weekend. <laughs> she, should, she should be getting home from that now, right? They're just, they have just chips and junk all over the room. Um, then again, one thing you can do is just be like, you know, just make sure that your space is clean of those things. You keep yourself full so that you're not hungry and triggered by that hunger to eat something you shouldn't. But I find that in social situations, people are very likely uh, to be kind, supportive and welcoming if you just let them know. And, and I think that also goes a lot into self-esteem because um, people are afraid to be different. They're afraid to stand out. They're afraid to be trouble. And it's just not. It's not trouble when you give people a heads up and when you let them know. Um, and, and it's also okay to say no to things, even if someone meant well. Um, I have a lot of folks who eat things they shouldn't because someone made them something and they didn't know what vegan was. And so they maybe put butter in it or, or maybe, you know, they're eating raw right now and it's cooked, whatever it is. And so they just feel like the only nice thing to do to say thank you would be to eat it, even if it's going to go against their health. And, uh, and I help people with that a lot too, because that happens to us all the time. And you can say, thank you, heartfelt. Thank you for thinking of me. I actually don't eat this. It's not on my, my diet, but I'm just so, so, um, I just feel so warmed inside by the fact that you thought of me and that you would do this for me. So I actually don't eat that. So you get all the credit for the gift. And I'm just, I love you so much. Thank you. There might be someone else, you know, that might want to eat that. Um, but I appreciate it. And every time they don't, they don't mind. In fact, next time they do better. We had a long-term problem. I don't know what she was thinking. My husband's one of his childhood friends wanted to do something nice for us. And she sent us one of those fruit bouquets, but it was chocolate covered. And the chocolate's not vegan or anything. And it was kind of funny when she went, how did you like the, the fruit bouquet? Because Tom wrote to her like, thank you so much for thinking of us. We appreciate you. And she went, how did you like it? And he goes, well, we're vegan, so we didn't eat it. But we thank you <laughs> that you thought of us. And she went, oh, my God, what was I thinking? And she said, no, one, no chocolate. Um, but it was no, it was fine, right? So, so you're not going to, it's important not to, um, to sacrifice your health, your ethics, what you care about in order to try to make other people happy. Because the secret I always tell people is you can't make other people happy. Other people have to be responsible for their own happiness. And you can thank someone for their kindness and their thoughtfulness and still not go against something that, that you know uh, is not good for you, or it's against your commitment to yourself. So that does take some emotional work. And I do a lot of help with people on the emotional health side of things, because, you know, your diet choices are, are, are a result of things like your addictions and also your insecurities and your emotional health, right? That people tend to eat badly when they're stressed or when they're depressed and also when they feel socially uncomfortable. So that one takes a little bit more work right? Than just planning ahead like the other two did. But it's so important because until everybody is plant-based, it's going to come up where you're going to be in social situations where it's not going to be, you know, what you would choose to eat. And you have to make that decision in the moment. Um, another thing that, that I really talk to people about is your brain, when you're first giving up foods you're addicted to, um, will find a lot of excuses and reasons why you should give in. Because it wants to, because it's addicted and it wants the junk, right? And so until those addictions go away, your brain might try to convince you like, oh, well, what's a little bit? I'm hungry. There's no other options. And in social situations, you're going to have that. And so what I've always told my clients is, listen, you know, once I decided that this is how I eat, anything that wasn't that no longer is food in my mind. You know, so if I go to a party and there's nothing plant-based there, I don't suddenly decide to go off my plan. I just tell myself, well, there's no food at the party. And then I don't even think about it again. I don't even think about it because there's no food. It would be like if you sent me to a party and all they had on the table was cat food, I wouldn't suddenly have an emotional crisis. Is today the day I eat cat food? I don't know. I'm so hungry and I didn't eat beforehand and everyone else is eating cat food. Maybe I should, no, there'd be nothing, right? It would just go, ew, cat food. And then I'd move on, enjoy the party and then leave and go get something to eat, right? So so if you can do that, and I have one client in my group said whenever she had food cravings, she would open cat food and smell it. She kept it in her fridge. She just smell it and remind herself. But if you've made the decision, then it doesn't matter the circumstances, you are going to stick to it. Just like what Chef AJ said before, like I'm only faithful to my husband sometimes, right? I always tell people, commit to your diet like you would commit to your significant other, right? You don't get married and go, oh, but he's cute. She's cute. I don't know. Is today the day I cheat? No, it's just 
this is my commitment. This is my person. This is what I do, right? So you've got to commit in the same way that no matter where you are, no matter how inconvenient it is, no matter how hungry you are, that this is what you do. And if you do that, you'll find the planning becomes easier too, right? I'm not going to show up somewhere hungry if I don't know that there's going to be food for me. Uh, I'm always going to show up full. Um, and plant eaters, we're kind of in the habit of always eating anyway. So uh, I always joke about that when people say that, you know, I'm too hungry plant-based versus when I eat meat. I'm like carnivores, you ever notice them? They'll eat like once, twice a week. Herbivores, they're eating the whole day. <laughs> we just, just get used to eating more, right? So I don't show up hungry anywhere, and that that helps a lot too. Um, so that's the social aspect of it. Do you think though that there are different personalities? Some people it's just easier, and other people they're just like kind of very people pleasing, and it's just hard for them to not eat something that was made just for them. Hundred percent, and that's why a lot of it comes from self esteem, right? Um, people pleasing is uh, it's a trap, right? So. I could spend a whole show talking about what people pleasing is and where it comes from and why people do it, but it comes from a place of insecurity. A lot of times when people feel the need to please others, they learned as a child at some point that my value is in what I give or do for others, right? That I'm not inherently lovable for who I am, but for what I do. And so when people have that belief about themselves, they're always afraid that if they don't do what other people want them to do, that they're not gonna love them anymore. They're not gonna be happy with them anymore. And so it's a really important thing to overcome to realize that that you are valuable and lovable exactly as you are, who you are, whatever you eat, whatever you do, that that love is non-negotiable. That's inherent to who you are. What you do, that's a personal choice for you, right? So if I do something for someone and it's not what they wanted, then I want them to let me know so I can do what they want, right? If somebody wants to make me something because they love me and want to do something nice for me, then that's wonderful. I'll tell them what to do so that they can do so that they can give me the gift that I actually want. Right. So um, it's one of the things I love to do. I love giving gifts to people, um, but they have to be thoughtful. It has to be perfect. Right. So I, I love it because it's so fun to see someone's face when you give them something that's exactly what they wanted. So how do I figure that out? I don't give them what I want. I get to know them. I ask them questions about things they like so that I can come up with something that exactly meets their desires, their needs, right? I'm not going to get them something that I think is good. So it's really an important thing that if if you want to make people happy and somebody's trying to make you something, then what would make them happy is to know what to make you and to and to give you what you want. But yeah, people pleasing, there's steps to recovering from that. And one of them is one, giving yourself that love and acceptance that I can live my life the way I want to, and I'm equally deserving of love and friendship. Um, and that I'm allowed to take up space and be who I am. And that doesn't take away from anybody else. And that people pleasing doesn't work. If somebody's happiness is dependent on whether or not you eat their, their sandwich they made you, then their happiness is very brittle. They need to work on their self-care. Um, you can't make people happy, um, but you can make yourself happy. So yeah, it is a condition, just like perfectionism. It's not real. I always tell people there's no perfectionism. There's fear of failure, but there's no perfect right? So a lot of the times these emotional things that come up socially, especially are really about people's self-esteem and their own willingness to love and accept themselves and be willing to, to give other people the opportunity to love and accept them as they are, rather than trying to bend into a new shape that might be more pleasing to that person. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about, about the restaurant situation. And I, one of the things I learned at college, the only thing I remember from business law at the University of Pennsylvania, my professor Murray B. Dolphman used to say, you don't ask, you don't get. And the thing is, is if you don't ask, the answer is always no. And, and it's amazing how restaurants sometimes are willing to be creative. Like I remember one time th there was like really nothing. Like, and, and then I said, well, hey, you have this omelet bar and I see you're putting in spinach and red bell pepper. Can you just put that on the plate and skip the eggs, you know? Yeah, we once went to, this was, this was uh, funny. We went to a wedding once where they also knew how we ate. So it was a little surprising when we showed up and the whole wedding was like uh, stations of different meat carving. And it was, and then there was one salad that was already coated in like Caesar that had egg in it. And it was served, served in like a champagne glass. And we were there with the kids. And, and normally I never show up unaware, but this was like, I won't, I won't say who it is. <laughs> Someone who knew us well, who obviously didn't think ahead. And so it was kind of surprising. And so we started talking to, I, I didn't want to bother the bride group. This is their day. I'm not going to bother them at all. So I talked to the people who were working in the kitchen. I was like, you got anything, right? And so finally what they come up with is, 
all of the flower arrangements were actually made out of fruits and vegetables. So they brought the arrangements to our table and my kids and my husband and I ate the uh, fruit and vegetable flowers and things. And <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> funny? I've heard Dr. Goldhammer say that he just eats the decorations. Yeah, sometimes you got to eat the kale off this elbow. But I mean, planning ahead, that was that was a surprise moment. We normally are way more prepared. And we did eat before we went, so it wasn't an emergency. But um, yeah, if you if you plan or if you ask, there's usually something, there's an ingredient that they can use for sure. But it's funny, when you mentioned asking, it reminded me of when my Solomon, he's, he's going to be 14 in, a, in, in the beginning of February. Um, but when he was like, I'm trying to remember, I think he was like six years old. We were at a vegan restaurant and he ordered something and they came over and they said, uh, how was it? And he goes, it would good, but it would have been nice to get more. And they went, no problem. They brought him another one for free and he got to eat two plates for the price of one, just because he asked. They were so impressed. That, that is so asked. cool. That's so they're probably not used to people eating healthy in general and kids especially. Yeah, but I mean it helps if you got a cute little button face like it, but it was just so funny that he just thought that, well, it would be nice to have more. And okay, no problem. And they just brought him. Uh so yeah, it's always good to ask. And especially like I said, if you ask ahead, it's definitely easiest because then when you show up, you can just let them know I'm the one that called. Um, but even in the moment, I've never had a problem with just getting some food, some food. And most restaurants, like you said, they have the ingredients. You just got to ask them to put it all in a bowl. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the so that brings me to the next one, which I think is really, really important is people worry about support that it's really hard to go plant-based because nobody supports me. My friends criticize me. My family members criticize me. Everyone says I'm doing something stupid or crazy and I'm getting too thin or all these things, right? There's all these criticisms and they feel so unsupported. And, you know, one of the things my husband always really amps on with people is that you tend to give in to your environment, right? So if your environment's very unsupportive, eventually you're going to give in, right? Because it's so hard to stand on your own. And so one of the biggest things I really work to teach my clients is how to get support. People kind of assume that that people will just support you or not support you. And that and that's just who they are. And that's just how life is. But support is something you have to learn how to ask for. And so what I always tell folks who feel unsupported is you need to tell people what you need. So you, if you just say, will you support me? They might not know what that means. They might go, I am supporting you. I'm trying to tell you that what you're doing is unhealthy, right? And so what you have to say is, here's what support means to me. I need your support because I'm doing something hard and something that means a lot to me. It gives me hope and I want to do this for myself. And so what I need is support. And what support looks like is encouragement, you know, um, not asking me or telling me that it's bad, uh, not encouraging me to have a cheat day or eat one bite or something else. I just need a cheerleader. That would be the support that I need. And if you can't cheer me on, then don't talk about it. Right. So I would say it's basically cheer me on or shut up, but in nicer words, right. That, that I'm not asking you to argue with me about this. I'm not asking you to criticize me about this. I'm asking you to give me this cheerleading, this, you know, to tell me that go get it, do a good job. I'm here for you. What can I do to help you? Right. So if you can ask for support, you might find way more people support you than you think. Um, people don't know how to do this correctly. And this works too. And I help people with their marriages in general that, you know, you can't assume people know what you want. And a lot of the folks who feel the most unsupportive are the people pleasers because they're like, I spend all of my day thinking about what other people need and trying to be that for them. Why doesn't anyone ever think of me? Why doesn't anyone ever take care of me? And it's because most people don't spend their whole day trying to think of what other people need. They're thinking about themselves, their lives, what they need. They're not thinking about you and your needs. So you have to tell them. And when you specifically say, here's what I need, People who love you will show up and they'll do that for you. Uh, I had a client who wanted to go out on a girl's night to a Mexican restaurant and she knew what she wanted to do. They had all the salad ingredients and she was going to get guacamole pico de gallo on top. Like it's all set. But she knew that as soon as they put those chips on the table, she was in danger. You get one taste of that perfect combo of oil and salt. You're not stopping. Right. So she just let her girlfriends know. I can't wait to see you guys, but I'm on the special diet. So please, when the chips come to the table, keep it where I can't reach it. And they did. The, the, the other girls, they brought it all the way over so she couldn't reach. I, and she, you know, if I try, you stack that hand back, right? But she, it was out of her reach. 
She got a whole bunch of chopped vegetables to dip into her own guacamole and she did great. She had so much fun, right? If she hadn't told her friends, they might've encouraged her differently. Like, oh, you've been so good, have a little bit, right? That they think that that's kind, but it's not. And when it comes to food, people are so much more willing to try to get you to eat what you don't want to eat than they would ever be to someone you use who has a drug problem or an alcohol problem, right? Like you, it, it, you can't imagine someone saying, oh, just take one hit to someone who has a cocaine addiction or, you know, some other drug addiction. Someone says I'm an alcoholic, you're not going to say, well, come on, it's a birthday. You have to have a drink, right? Or, or you'd hope not. But when someone's on a special diet, people feel perfectly fine saying, come on, it's their birthday. Why aren't you eating cake? In fact, people used to say that to me when I used to work at nonprofit. And they would say that, come on, it's a birthday. You have that birthday cake. I was like, Listen, I, I sang the song. I signed the gift card. Right. I gave I signed the card. I donated money to the gift card. I did all the things. I don't eat that, you know, and it's not right to try to force me to peer pressure me. I mean, peer pressure doesn't work. I mean, in general. Right. But it's not right. So it's OK to say, no, uh, I don't do that. But when you can give people that heads up, it really helps them understand that I feel so unsupported when you do that, whether it's criticizing my food, criticizing my weight. People are also much more willing to tell you you're too skinny than to tell someone they're fat. Right. Um, so being willing to stand up and say, this is me healthy. This is me working on myself. I need compliments. I need, I need cheerleading, you know, but I definitely don't need criticism because it's hard enough without that. And so support is something that you're not going to just get. It's something you have to teach people how to give you. And when you do that, you're going to find you're happier everywhere in your diet, in your life, in your relationships. With, you know, it's one thing to not support someone, but it's also another thing to actually sabotage them. And I hear from people, especially people that consider themselves food addicts, like the the lady in your story about the chips that, you know, can't have any non-compliant food in the house. And it's not so much that their husband and uh, children will not support them. They'll actually make it harder for them and purposely like bring in these things. Why do people do that? And, And what's the workaround? Well, I think there's a, there's a whole lot of psychology about that, but Um, one of the issues is when you're doing something to help yourself and to get healthy, it tends to make other people uncomfortable because it makes them realize what they're not doing. Right. That, uh, that (laughs) we had, we had a friend tell us that, uh, that, you know, it's hard for other couples to be around my husband and me because he's like, if you guys are so happy and so in sync, it makes me look at my significant other and go, uh, that's why don't you do that? Why aren't you like that? Right. That, it, whether it's your your relationships or your health or whatever it is, when someone's really dialing it in and working hard and, and trying to live better, then if you're not doing that, you might kind of feel insecure, uncomfortable looking at it and going, man, I don't have that. I'm not doing that. So it's easier to get the other person to be wrong or to give in than it is to change yourself. It's one of the reasons why vegans find people are so quick to criticize them, right? That why is it that if someone's eating a burger and fries, nobody bothers them. But if I'm eating a salad, someone's going to go, why are you doing that? And look, you stepped on the grass and that hurt plants and this and that. And they start trying to poke holes in their lives. Why? Because if you can make the person wrong, you can dismiss what they're doing and then you can keep doing what you're doing, right? So if you can make the other person wrong, Easy. I don't have to listen to them. They're doing stuff wrong. That's why my son wrote his book, right? The comeback book. That's like, nope, here's all the reasons it's right. But the other side of it is if I can get them to give in and do what I'm doing, then I don't need to change, right? They're eating it too. Look, it's unsustainable. They're not even doing it and I'm fine, right? So I think that there's a lot of what's happening there is the person's not intending to be sabotaging and unsupportive, at least not consciously, but unconsciously, they would feel a lot more comfortable if you would just get back to eating you know, chicken and fries with the rest of us rather than you eating that healthy salad and me feeling bad about myself now that I know I'm eating unhealthy and I don't have the willpower you do. I don't have the motivation you do. Right. So it's a lot easier to bring people back down to what you're doing than to encourage and support them and to let them elevate you. Right. Because nobody wants to change and people don't want to give up the things they're addicted to. They don't want to change is difficult, whether it's relationships or whether it's food, it's difficult to change. It's easier to kind of put your blinders on and stay the same. It's why people don't change unless things become too painful or painful enough, right? People don't come to me because they're like, oh, I think green smoothies sound a lot better than a bagel and cream cheese, right? They do it because their illness, their health has gotten painful enough 
that it's worth it to give up those things they're addicted to, to try something better, right? People don't leave bad relationships until the negativity and abuse becomes so bad that it's worth going through the pain of divorce and all of the things that come with it, right? That we need humans in general, we need it to be painful enough to change, right? And so it, we don't want anyone shining a light on what's wrong in our lives when we're not ready to change. So I think that's the biggest reason. And, and again, I don't think it's a conscious attack, but it just makes people feel more comfortable with themselves. If she's willing to eat cake, then I can eat cake and everything's fine. But if she won't eat cake, well, it is a lot of oil and sugar and dairy and oh man, and I do have high cholesterol and I shouldn't be eating this. And man, I just want to enjoy cake. Why did she do this to me? Right? So it's a lot. And you got to be strong. You got to be willing to um, to do what's right for you and to also let them know, you know what, what you're doing right now is making this harder for me. And I'm working so hard on myself. I need your support. I need cheerleading. I need encouragement. I don't want you to encourage me to do something that's against my goals for myself. Yeah, that might be the best answer for that question I've ever heard. You know, Dr. Lyle always says, whenever there's a problem, look to status. Thank you so much for explaining that. Absolutely. Well, the human mind is, uh, that's my forte, <laughs> I'm a study of people. And it's really important, you know, when you change your diet, everything comes to the surface, right? It highlights your communication ability, your self-confidence, your support system, right? Anytime you try to do something big to change your life, everything else suddenly becomes highlighted. And, and that's why it's so hard. A lot of people don't realize that you know, it's not just a diet change. You are changing everything. And that's why it can feel very difficult. And that's why I wanted to have this discussion today because it would be great if it was like, oh, what? Broccoli's healthy? Oh, I'll just eat more broccoli, right? And, and, and oh, meat back? I'll just stop doing that. It's not just the education that people need. It's really the support and the health and changing all of these other factors. The way I think about food, the way I think about myself, the way I have boundaries with people, the way I stand up for myself, the way I plan for myself, all these things have to come in alignment for any huge change in the way you live your life. Fantastic. All right. And the number one, number one, hardest part about being plant-based or vegan, hardest part, it's just making the decision. Hardest part, right? Once you've made the decision, everything else becomes easy. Like I'm vegan now. So therefore I don't eat these ingredients. So if someone makes me a dish with those ingredients, I don't eat that. No problem. Right. Uh, once you have that decision made, the stress kind of melts away. The highest stress I see people under is when they haven't decided yet. But what about the birthday? And what about when I travel? And what about when I do this? And what about when I do that? Their brain is building all these objections and worries and, and potential and imaginary things that are going to happen. And it keeps them in a state of indecision and stress and anxiety versus when you make a decision, it all falls away. It's one of the biggest things that I teach my client is about what real commitment is. hundred percent commitment, right? When you're hundred percent committed, there's no anxiety. This is just what I do. Like I'm hundred percent committed to my husband. I have zero anxiety about who is going to go with, who's going to be my Valentine. There's no, there's no, no stress. I know who it is. Right. So, so once you're hundred percent committed, it's a very calm place. I'm 100% committed to the way I eat and the way I live my life. So it doesn't matter how hungry I am. It doesn't matter what part of the earth I'm on. That's not going to change. That's just, this is the commitment that I have made and I'm very calm about it. But when people are in that state where they're even 1% uncommitted, very stressful. I went to the party. There's no food. I'm hungry. What do I do? Because that's the part of your brain that's like, is today the day we cheat? Is today the day we stop? Is it, you know? So as long as your brain thinks that there is a potential time limit to what you're doing, it's going to try to give you like, here's the opportunity. Here's the right level of stressors to take you off the plan. But if you're hundred percent committed, it just falls away because there's no other choice. It's this or it's that food, not food. And all the anxiety <clears throat> really disappears about it. So one of the, that's the hardest part by far for people when they are in that state where they're like, I'm watching all of the videos on Chef AJ's channel. I'm watching all the videos by all these other doctors. I'm trying to convince myself to do this, right? That if you're fully convinced and ready, it's easy. Here's just, I just need to know what to do to buy and I'm going to go buy it. Um, but if you're even 1% not committed, then your brain's going to give you a whole detailed list of all the reasons this is going to be too hard for you. Not just these reasons I gave, but hundreds more. So the most important thing you can do really is if you think this is the right thing for you, is you just make the commitment, I'm going to do it. You've had 
X many days, years, decades of doing it the other way. And the life you're living right now is a result of the way you've lived it, what you've eaten, how you've treated yourself. That's where you are right now. It's a result of all the work you've done up until now. And so now you have the opportunity to commit 100% to doing it a new way to see if you can have a better life. So by far, I think the hardest part of all of this is just making the choice. Wow. Well, this is very inspiring. If I wasn't vegan already, I would go vegan. <laughs> so you you told me right before we logged on that you do some kind of live Q&As. And I'm wondering if you could tell the audience how they can access those because we had about 13 people that yeah. sent questions specifically for you. So perhaps I can refer them there or maybe yeah. next month we can answer some of them, whatever you feel is best. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest things that I've done, and you you know me, is that, um, you know, for me, I feel like uh, the re- one of the, my biggest reasons that I think I had lupus and overcame it is to help others do the same. Like, how did I end up being a doctor and then got rid of lupus by changing my diet? All right. And I'm alive when I shouldn't be. I have kids when I shouldn't, according to Western medicine. So I have this constant drive to share and help as much as I can. Um, and so one of the ways that I've been able to do that, and it took me months to get it into my schedule was to set aside time once a week for Q and A's for the public. So I release my protocol to the public for free, all of the things I can do for free, I can. And that's just one other thing. So the way I'm doing it now is I'm actually live streaming the Q and A's, um, to all my social media at once. So it's on my YouTube channel. Um, it's on my, um, Instagram, Facebook. So at Goodbye Lupus, you can find in any of those areas. And so it's every Wednesday at 1230 Pacific, I come on live and I just answer as many questions as I can in an hour. And, uh, and people come, hundreds of people to every station or every spot. And I just go from one to the next to the next. And, uh, and it's been really popular. I'm excited about that. I'm getting so much good feedback where even if they don't get their question answered, somebody asked something that helped them. So that's something I think I've done six of them now. Uh, this Wednesday should be the seventh. So it's been my, uh, that was my new year's resolution was uh, I want to try to find even more time to give back to the public. So this is one of the ways I'm doing it is, is being on your channel. And then um, Wednesdays at 1230. So, um, Wait, so that's- you said 11. So 1230, it's 1230. 12.30 Pacific time. 12.30 Pacific time. Instagram, and just- Facebook, at Goodbye Lupus, and uh, and then YouTube. Uh, the thing is under Brooke Oldner MD, but if you look up Goodbye Lupus, you'll find it as well. Okay, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes so maybe we can oh, send the people you. with the questions. Maybe we can uh, tell them where to go to get them answered. Yes, yeah. And, you know, it's a lot of people have the same questions, you know, um, but uh, but it's been really nice to be able to get that get out there and give people the extra layer of support. So definitely check that out if you're interested in more of that. Nice. Oh, you got me a super chat. Thank you, Diana Banana. That's great. Well, this is fun. I look forward to having you on as a monthly guest. I know how busy you are. So I'm very honored that you're taking the time to do this because our people love you. You get so many people watching. So many people have been helped by your protocol. They've been typing that in the chat. You probably can't see that. Like, for example, Anne says, Dr. Goldner is absolutely brilliant and one of the best speakers to show us how to overcome any struggles. What a helpful and wonderful interaction between the two of you. So just so many nice comments. You could probably look at them. Oh, I'm going to check them all out. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that. Folks are so nice. Uh, In general, people are so nice online. And I appreciate that because I know it's not always that way. (laughs) Except you get those occasional trolls that just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But again, uh, once you've established the ability to help people, I, I know you have then your other folks are willing to jump in and say, actually, no, this has helped me. And all I'm trying to do is get people to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, right? I mean, oh, yeah. God forbid, right? You know, it's interesting. Somebody posted in the chat that a nutritionist told them that the way that we eat is an eating disorder. You've heard that probably that uh, orthorexia or, you know, the, the restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen, I'm also a psychiatrist. And so uh, I'm a trauma specialist. I've worked with people in eating disorder clinics, inpatient, as well as trauma survivors. And um, listen, the the thing about the medical world is they're always looking for a way to pathologize things, right? You can turn anything into a disease. Now, I agree that if someone is so obsessed with their food and their diet, that that's all they can think about and it's generating anxiety for them, then we should be looking at that. But, you know, for me, it actually gives me a great peace. Yes, I have a very specific diet that I eat, 
but I don't think about it. I don't stress about it. I know what I eat and I'm so happy because I feel so amazing. So in the beginning, it can take a lot of attention because you have to learn it, right? What do I eat and how do I prepare it and how do I get it all in? But if you can come at it from a place of excitement and enthusiasm rather than a place of stress, that's going to help a lot. And so, you know, I always talk to people about it that if you, you know, fall down, if you mess up, that's okay. That's how toddlers learn, right? They fall down and they get up and they toddle again and they fall down and then they just keep recalibrating their balance until one day they're running, right? So, so you have to be very forgiving for yourself. Try to find all the enthusiastic reasons and exciting reasons that you do this. And, you know, if someone wants to pathologize about them, you can use my, my, uh, my advice about support to let them know that you're really not looking for their, uh, for their criticism, but really you're excited about something good you're doing for your life. But there, there are eating disorders, of course, out there. And I've actually helped a lot of people. I've had people with anorexia and bulimia do my rapid recovery programs, and they've actually done really well because it's a new way of thinking where you can have unlimited amounts of these foods and it only makes you healthier and leaner and fitter, right? Whereas coming from the other way, it's like, oh, I have to limit my portions and, and I can't eat. I have to be hungry all the time. I don't want people to be hungry. I want people to be full, right? So, you know, it helps rehabilitate the way they think about food. But I definitely have had some people say that, you know, their, you know, their, their eating disorder coaches don't like it um, because we're eliminating certain food groups. And when I was uh, working with folks in the hospital, one of the things they would do is they don't want them to think about food or ingredients. <clears throat> they want them not to think about food at all. So just eat whatever's on your plate without thinking. And I, I think we can do better than that, where we can re rehabilitate. Um, maybe they, those people shouldn't get weighed. That, that could be problematic, but really rehabilitating where there are actually foods that are bad, but not because of keeping you fat, but because it's self-harm, like a drug, right? And that, that, that you want to love your body with good foods. And when you're eating good foods, you don't have to limit yourself and you don't have to starve yourself. So um, it's, it's very different though, from the way they are trained in eating disorders. And so in the eating disorder world, any limiting or any quantifying or anything like that, you are now in the disordered realm. And, uh, and so, yeah, you just have to understand that. And if you are someone who's feeling that way, that you are anxious, that you are not eating, um, that you need more psychological support, I suggest you do that. And I also suggest you find a, a plant-based therapist so that you don't get pressured um, to, to eat the wrong things in order to be healthy. Yeah, emotionally healthy. Hopefully, you'll write a book just on this type of thing. And do you do still therapy with people? Like, could you be I do. A I, do. Um, I, I do. I love it. And, uh, and it's, it's one of my strengths. And so one day a week I dedicate to uh, psychotherapy, working with people with trauma uh, a lot, of, but um, yeah, most of the time people want me for like, I want to get healthy. I want to change the way I live my life, but really all of the work I do, even in helping people change their diet, I'm always instinctively addressing the emotional side, right? Like if someone does a wellness appointment with me, it's 75 minutes because I need to get to know them. What's going to be your like number one, self-sabotage, what are your stressors? What's your support system like? And what do you eat? So it's kind of built into my work because it's built into the way I interact with people is to address all the emotional factors as well as the um, just the diet. But my book, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, is mostly the psychological side. I wrote it because people are like, well, I know it helps lupus, but what about scleroderma? What about Sjogren's? What about mixed connective tissue disease? What about MS? And so I initially was writing it to, to put in the case studies for those diseases, which I did. There's dozens of case studies of different diseases, but the majority of the book ended up being, if you read Goodbye Lupus, which is this thick, and it's like, here's what to eat, and you didn't follow the plan, then here's all the reasons you probably didn't. And it's all the different things, self-sabotage and self-care and self-love and dealing with anxiety and depression and trauma. Most of the book is actually the emotional work. Yeah, well, great. Well, let's let's talk about that in future shows because that is so yeah, important. I'd be happy to. It's just the time just flies with you, Dr. Goldman. Thank you so much. It's just it's just fun. It's like talking to a friend. So we look forward to having you back next month. And I will definitely send people to your Q&A and maybe I'll watch it myself because I'm sure I can learn more because people always write me about these diseases and I'm like, I don't know, watch her, you know, <laughs> eat plants. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm excited to do it. It's really good to see you. Thanks. Same here. And if you ever want to bring those adorable kids or your husband on, you know, it's your show. So I'm just here to be the moderator. Awesome. Fun. Thank you. All right. See everybody. Thanks. Take for care. Thanks so much, Dr. Goldner. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for Move Well to Age Well with our plant-based physical therapist, Eileen Kopsovich.